What is a domain service? Sometimes you will find business logic that doesn't naturally belong to any of your entities and this is a nice use case to encapsulate the business logic inside of a domain service. So in this video I'm going to show you how to create one. I'll be using the run tracker domain for the example and I'm going to focus on the relationship between the user and their followers. The use case I want to implement is for users to be able to follow other users in the system. In order to model this relationship, I can use two tables in the database, one for the users and another for the followers. And in the followers table, I'm going to have two foreign keys. One will be the user ID representing the user who is following someone and the second foreign key will be the followed user ID representing the user of the system that we are following. We're going to use both columns as part of the composite primary key and we can create an index on the columns to speed up the queries. For example, we could run this query to get the number of followers for a given user and we could run this query to get the users that are following a specific user. So this is the high level design and now let's see how I'm going to implement this in my domain. I already have the user entity so I'm going to start by introducing a folder to contain my followers aggregate. I'm going to call this folder followers and I'm going to create one entity inside that's going to represent my followers table. So the entity will be called follower and I'm going to add the two properties to match the columns that I want to have in the database. So I'm going to make this inherit from the entity base class, but I won't be using the ID that's exposed on the entity because I want to be using a composite primary key to uniquely identify a follower. And the properties are going to be the user identifier, which will be the user who is following someone. And the second property will be the followed users identifier which will be the user that we are following. Additionally, I can also create a date time column for the created on date and time. So I'm going to define this property as well. And now I'm going to create a constructor and I'm going to make it internal and I'm going to accept the user ID, the followed user ID and the created on date and time as part of my constructor. I made the constructor internal so that it's available inside of the domain assembly and I'm planning on creating a domain service that's going to encapsulate the business logic for creating a new follower. With the constructor being internal, it's going to be available inside of my domain service. And as we progress with the implementation, we'll see if we need to change this design. Before moving on, I'm going to run the test that I have in my system. And you're going to see that one of my architecture tests is going to fail. And this specific test is checking that my entity has a private parameterless constructor. So I'm going to create this constructor because it's going to be used by my ORM later when I introduce it to the solution. And if I rerun this test, you'll see that it's now passing. So this is why having tests is really valuable because you get a very short feedback loop when you make some changes in your code base. So now let's go ahead and create my domain service. I'm going to call it the follower service and it's going to be responsible for creating a new follower and making sure that we enforce our business rules. So let's make this a public and sealed class. And this is a domain service. I'm going to start by creating a method inside, which I will call start following. It's going to have a few arguments. One is going to be the user who is now trying to follow another user in the system. The second argument will also be a user, except this will be the followed user. And I'm also going to add a date time argument for the created on date and time, which we need to create a new follower. So let me outline the high level steps that I want to implement inside of this method. First of all, I want to validate the user and the followed user to see if they satisfy the conditions before we can create a new follower. Then I want to check if they are not already following each other or more specifically the user isn't already following the second user. Then once I'm past the validations, I want to create the new follower and add it to the repository. And lastly, I want to send a notification to notify the followed user that they have gained a new follower. So let's start implementing these one by one. So first of all, I want to validate that these are not the same users. I'm going to check this 
by comparing their identifiers because this is how you compare two entities. And let's say if the user ID is equal to the followed user ID, I'm going to throw a new exception and I'm going to say that you can't follow yourself. The second check that I need to implement is if the followed user has a public profile or rather I need to check the opposite condition if the followed user does not have a public profile, then I can't become their follower. So I'm going to throw an exception if we are trying to follow a user who doesn't have a public profile. And let's say can't follow non-public profile. So these were the simple checks that we could do on the entities. And then the second one requires us to go and talk to a database. So in this case, I need to introduce some sort of service that's going to allow me to interface with the database and I'm going to create an iFollower repository interface and I'm going to use this interface to define the methods that I will need to talk with the database. I'm going to define a method inside that's going to be asynchronous and it will return a boolean value and I will call it is already following async because this is an asynchronous method. It's going to have the user ID as the argument and then the followed user ID as the second argument and it will be able to check if a follower already exists for these identifiers. Then I'm going to expose a cancellation token because I want to support cancellation on my repository. And now I can use my repository in the domain service to inject it from the constructor. So let's create the iFollower repository. I'm going to inject it from the constructor and then I'm going to use it inside of the start following method. Now this method now has to become asynchronous and I'm also going to call it start following async because we're going to be calling an asynchronous method inside. And I'm also going to expose one more argument that will be the cancellation token. So now I'm going to check if the follower repository and we're going to call the is already following method and pass it the arguments that it's expecting. So I'm going to pass the user ID, the followed user ID and the cancellation token. And if this evaluates to true, then I'm going to throw another exception because we already have the relationship defined in our database. So let's throw a new exception and I'm just going to say already following. If we get past this check, then we are ready to create our follower. So I'm going to create a new follower instance and we already created the constructor. And now let's pass it the user ID, the followed user ID and the created on date and time. Then I need to insert this user to the repository. And for this, I'm going to create the insert method on the repository interface. So let's define it below and let me just clean up the definition of these methods so that you can see everything nicely on the screen. So this is the iFollower repository and this is a common debate when designing your domain services, whether you want to use access to the database or not. In this case, I'm making a trade-off and introducing the repository in my domain layer and mind you, this is just the interface or the contract for my repository and the actual implementation will live in some of the outer layers, most likely the persistence or the infrastructure layer. And the benefit of this is that I can completely encapsulate any business logic inside of the domain service. Otherwise, I would have to do all of these checks inside of a use case in the application layer. So this approach promotes encapsulation and it makes testing easier because now I can test the follower service completely without any external dependencies, which means I can validate that my business logic is correct. So let's see what we have left in the start following async method. We did the validation. We checked if the users aren't already following each other and we created a new follower and inserted the follower to the repository. And the last thing that we need is to send a notification notifying the followed user that they have gained a new follower. So for side effects like this one, you could define another interface that's going to expose a method for sending a notification but this would be leaking too much implementation details to the domain. So I prefer using domain events to express side effects. So I'm going to get rid of this comment completely. I'm also going to move the iFollower repository into its own file and I'm going to head to my follower entity. So what I'm going to do here is the tried and true approach 
of creating a static factory method. What this will allow me to do is to raise a domain event inside of this method and return a new follower. So let's call this create. We're going to accept the same arguments as our constructor. So this will be the followed ID and the date time created on value. Let me create now a new follower based on my arguments. So follower equals new follower. Let's pass it the arguments to the constructor. And because this is an entity, I can go ahead and call the raise method and create a new domain event. I don't have one yet, but let's call it follower created domain event. And we're going to pass it the primary key of our follower entity. And this will be the user ID and the followed user ID. So we have a composite primary key and we have to pass both values to the domain event. And then I can return the follower from this method. Of course, I also need to define the domain event. So this is going to be a record because this is the convention that I like to use for creating domain events. And I'm going to copy the name from here and it's going to have the user ID and the followed ID as the arguments in this primary constructor and it's going to implement the iDomain event interface. And the reason I prefer using the static factory method is because I don't like raising domain events inside of a constructor, mainly because serializers could call the constructor and end up raising the domain event and this will produce unintended side effects in your domain. So this is why I avoid this approach altogether and I'm now going to make my follower constructor private because it's only called from the static factory method. And now if I go to the follower service, I'm going to get a compile error here because I can't call the constructor that is now private. I'm going to end up calling the static factory method. And this is the implementation that we end up with in our domain service, which completely encapsulates all the checks and the steps required to create a new follower. If you try to implement this business logic as part of the user entity, because we have two users following each other, you'll see that it doesn't really fit inside because we would have to reference the follower entity from our user entity. Secondly, if we tried to move all of this logic onto the user, then we would have to pollute the follower entity with external concerns to check the state of the database before being able to create a new follower. And this is why I decided to use a domain service to implement this functionality. If you enjoyed this video about domain services, then make sure to smash the like and the subscribe button. And until next time, stay awesome.